How about those nuggets? Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Crossroads of Indian Country. My name is Rick Waters, and I am Cherokee in Kiowa and serve as the Executive Director of the Denver Indian Center. Having spent the last 25 years working with foundations and fundraising within the Native community, I'm especially delighted to be a small part of this gathering of philanthropic energy. And just a quick note, I was reminded we had Native American Heritage Night at the Denver Nuggets earlier this year. And I had my Eagle fan and I blessed the team and the ball. So now you know the rest of the story. On behalf of the Denver American Indian community, I would like to welcome everyone here today as you prepare to discuss ideas, concepts, and strategies towards helping communities and entities the opportunity to equitably access funding support. I would especially like to thank the Council on Foundations and the organizers of Leading Locally 2023 for reaching out to the Native community and inviting me to offer a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement before an important event or activity is something that is happening more and more around the world, and especially in progressive or enlightened communities. In the United States, it recognizes and brings awareness and respect to American Indian people as the original inhabitants and stewards of the land, and also reminds people that despite the historic trauma and inequities experienced by Native people throughout history, we are still here. Accepting the fact that Native peoples endured forced removal from their homeland and often inhumane treatment is important when understanding the history that has brought each of you to this very place we are now standing. And when truly understood, American Indian history is American history. In 1963, President John Kennedy described what many called the invisibility of Native people when he stated, American Indians remain probably the least understood and most misunderstood Americans of us all, and that it seems a basic requirement to study the history of Indian people. He went on to say that America has much to learn about the heritage of American Indians, and only through this study can we as a nation do what must be done if our treatment of the American Indian is not to be marked down for all time as a national disgrace. With these thoughts in mind, I share this statement or land acknowledgement. Before this land we stand on became known as Denver or Colorado, it was Indian country and the homeland and territory from time immemorial to many tribal nations, including but not limited to the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Comanche, Shoshone, and Kiowa. Recognized in many circles as the crossroads of Indian country, this area of Colorado was a site of trade, travel, hunting, and spiritual healing for these tribes. Today, according to the 2020 census, the Front Range in Colorado is currently home to over 100,000 self-identified American Indian and Alaska Natives, along with two federally recognized Indian reservations, the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute, located in the southwest corner of the state. One of the biggest challenges faced in the American Indian community, especially those living in urban areas, is overcoming the invisibility as described by President Kennedy over 60 years ago. Recognizing the relationship of American Indian culture and history and its direct tie to the land we stand on today, a land acknowledgement is a step in bringing about visibility, understanding and awareness of the Native community, and one that we can all share. Similar to the mission and vision of Council on Foundations, the Denver Indian Center advocates for equity in all areas of social determinants, including philanthropy and its delivery system, not only for Native Americans, but for all community members. We are all related. In closing, as you participate in this conference over the next few days, make a commitment when returning to your respective organizations, homes, and communities to reach out and see how you could partner with and better understand the Native community and share your time, energy, and resources. It takes coming together to get things done via networking, partnering, and collaboration. All parts of an action plan for progress and change that works. As a famous Cherokee statesman once said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. 
Let's continue to work together towards building more effective and equitable philanthropic systems of serving and empowering our communities, and especially those challenged with fewer opportunities and resources. Because at the end of the day, everyone benefits. Have a productive conference and enjoy your time in Denver. Aho, thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. On behalf of Colorado's philanthropic sector, we think it's pretty great to be hosting all of you here in our state. Welcome. And let's hear it from the Colorado folks. I think there are a lot of you here. Are you here? I'm Joanne Kelly, CEO of Philanthropy Colorado. We're the statewide network of 120 foundations and funding agencies that advocate for and invest in communities throughout Colorado. Knowing I'd be standing here next to Javier and the leaders from Colorado who'll be joining us on our plenary stage uh, in a few minutes, I ref reflected on the theme of place, the theme of the conference, and how place-based problems can be addressed by philanthropy taking an interconnected approach. It's not about isolated people or isolated organizations or isolated issues. It's more about what I so admire our arts funding community in Colorado doing, what it is dubbed arts and. Arts and health, arts and the environment, arts and racial equity. Artists themselves like to refer to liminal spaces, the places between the places where transformation and creativity happens. At Philanthropy Colorado, we're seeing tremendous potential in exploring place-based work at the intersection of philanthropy's long-time issues and those that often seem too big to tackle. Gun violence prevention and, climate change and, migration and, polarization and. All of these challenges are interconnected with almost any issue you can name kids, schools, mental health. They're playing out in equity and inclusion work, in policy and advocacy arenas, and urban and rural communities. I know Javier, our panelists this morning, and I think our 150 Colorado Foundation colleagues who are here, share my enthusiasm for how pleased and honored we are to host this convening and to learn from one another about the great work happening here and in places around the country, and perhaps even the world, as we all lead locally together. Thank you, Joanne. Kathleen, what great timing <laughs> to bring all these fine folks to Colorado and to, and to Denver. Good morning, I'm Javier Alberto Soto. I'm the President and CEO of the Denver Foundation. Welcome to the home of the 2023 NBA champions. <laughs> Some of you in the room know that I moved to Denver from Miami four years ago. <laughs> I did not lose a bet, I promise. <laughs> Miami is my hometown, and it's a place where I was proud to lead the Miami Foundation for 10 years. So yes, the NBA Finals were a bit tense at my house. My, my board chair is here somewhere. I'm just hoping he forgot about my Go Heat post on Facebook right before game one. Let's just <laughs> let's forget that ever happened. I am one of the many, many people who has chosen Denver as my home. And I feel so lucky to be in a place with amazing beauty, incredible businesses, and incredibly generous people. We're also an incredibly green city with over 200 parks and a deep commitment to climate protection. I had the honor of co-chairing the host committee and I'd like to express our gratitude to all of the volunteers who helped ensure that Colorado was highlighted in the program agenda. And if I could for a moment, anyone who served on the host committee, if you could just stand for one second real quick so we can recognize you. <laughs> you 
you all can appreciate these things don't just get thrown together at the last minute. There's been a year's worth of planning. Um, so again, my deep thanks to, to everyone on the host committee and all the volunteers. Um, in addition to making up a, a good proportion of the sponsorships for this event, the committee also submitted a number of session proposals, and you'll see many of those highlighted on your agenda. We also help support the development of our Give Back campaign through Colorado Gives Foundation to support our unhoused population here in Denver. And I saw QR codes in the back, so please do take a moment to participate with us in this campaign. We've also put together a welcome guide to help you um, find all of our favorite places nearby in the metro area. Now, before we kick off today, we do have some news to share. CF Insights, the benchmarking tool for community foundations, is joining forces with the council. As many of you know, CF Insights has been part of Candid since 2015. Both organizations have decided that the council's growing network of community foundations makes this the right time for this partnership between CFI and the council. And there will be much more information on this at the CFI booth outside the ballroom. Candid and the council are pleased to make this move together to better serve community foundations and place-based funders, and we're thrilled to be able to tell you first right here at Leading Locally. <laughs> Joanne circled the word place just a few moments ago, and I, I can assure you that you'll be hearing a whole lot about place over the next two days. Place is the key component of all the work that we do. So we want to thank you again for coming to our place. I'm looking forward to the discussions and the learnings um, throughout these next couple of days. Please enjoy your time and enjoy our amazing city and state. And with that, to kick us off, back to you, Joanne. Thanks, Javier. I now have the pleasure of introducing someone that I have known um, since I started in this role, which was a long time ago. And, uh, I have a lot of partners I can barely see, but I can see Iowa and New York over there, and I know California. We're all networks of networks, and we're all networked. And uh, Kathleen Enright, President and CEO of the Council on Foundations, is one of the first national members. The first thing she did in her role was to join the National Network United Philanthropy Forum. So we get to see each other, learn from each other, and lean on each other, and I'm just so pleased to have you here and to be able to welcome you to your stage. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joanne, for that kind introduction, and Javier, for your leadership of the host committee, really it would not, happen, would not have happened without you, your support, and the full committee. Thank you. We're, we're so grateful to be here, and I'm so glad that all of you decided to come. So have you ever seen something in a brand new light when you least expected it? I bet you for the parents in the room, as a parent, it happens to me all the time. In fact, it just happened recently with my daughter, Grace. She was practicing for a project. Uh, it's one of those projects where every kid has a quote about history and they go up on stage, they memorize it, um, and then they present it to try to bring some history to life. And so over dinner, hearing her practicing for her big day, I was completely caught off guard by a quote that I had heard many times before. And it's probably a quote you've heard too. It's this. Yes, we have fought for America with all her imperfections not so much for what she is, but for what we know she can be. Now, as I said, I've heard that quote before, but I had never felt it in quite the way I felt it that night. And then I had to explain to my 11-year-old why her homework was bringing me to tears. <laughs> Those words are from Mary McLeod Bethune. She's a black writer and educator who made history as part of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's black cabinet. That alone is an amazing accomplishment. But think of this. Dr. Bethune, worked with, who was born in South Carolina in 1875, uh, served her country, a country where her parents had been considered property. She believed in, still, 
the possibility of this country, and she worked her whole life to make it one that she could be proud of. Now, uh, what moved me so much that night, listening to Grace's words, was that even though we are still so many years away from the America that we know is possible, the only way we get there is when people of goodwill lean into hope and do their best to make it so. And that is philanthropy's work. That's all of your work. We're part of a tradition that goes back centuries. People who see our nation with all of its challenges and flaws and don't imagine it kinder and fairer, but do their work tirelessly to make it so. You know, now we are at a moment where we have to meet the times to be a force that unites in a divided time, one that enables healing and hope. And let's be clear, you all know it better than anyone. This is hard work. As leaders in the communities that make up the diverse United States, you are forging a path towards something better, all while dealing with disaster and crisis and polarization, making this work harder in recent years. But still, when a devastating pandemic broke out, you forged partnerships and expertly brought resources to where they were needed most because you know your communities. In a time of economic uncertainty and a national reckoning over racial injustice, you listened harder. You pledged more support, especially for communities of color that have been perpetually denied the appropriate resources. And you did so with fewer strings attached because you trust your communities. Every day, you are finding innovative ways to do your important work, focused not on yourself, but the people you serve and your mission and key partnerships because you love your communities. And we all know there is so much more work to be done, not just in responding to crises, but thinking proactively and creatively, how can we build a future that works for everyone? You know, the times, they, they sometimes feel pretty dark. But I see you every day building toward an America that we know is possible. And that is worth celebrating. You do it in three, with three fundamental commitments that I wanted to highlight today. The first one, which we'll be hearing about again in the, in the plenary in a moment, is you build resilience. You invest today so that communities will stand strong against the challenges of the future. I see that commitment in the work of Nikesha Williams that she's leading at the Miami Foundation. They're protecting <laughs> fragile land from storms, yes, but also they are expanding renewal ener renewable energy and creating cleaner, more efficient public transit. I also see it in the work that Heidi Binko from the Just, Lands, Just Transitions Fund is partnering with rural coal communities across the nation to get federal dollars into new economic solutions that work locally. These organizations are not focused on merely recovering. They are reimagining something altogether new. Strengthening their communities in service of the America that we believe is possible. Now, a second commitment I see operating every day in your work in, in philanthropy, particularly community philanthropy, is trust. Knowing how to work together on a problem, how to let go, how to lead, how to follow, particularly our nonprofit partners and other local leaders, all of this builds trust. You can see it in Oakland, California, where Brandi Howard and her team at the East Bay Community Foundation are making decisions in partnership with those closest to the issues. They established a $10 million fund governed by a group of community organizers to invest in local leaders of color, entrepreneurs of color even. And in Evanston, Illinois, where Carly Butler and her colleagues center their community-led grant making in the spirit of Ubuntu. And that is a term that many folks across Southern Africa use that means, I am because we are. The way these folks are exhibiting and building trust is a key ingredient in the third commitment I wanted to lift up today. And it's your efforts to create a sense of belonging. I think a lot about belonging these days, not just because of the council's work, but because my daughter is about to brave the scary halls of middle school. 
But sadly, that outsider feeling does not end at middle school. Research shows that most people don't feel like they belong in their workplace or their community or even our nation. And I have to tell you, I'm not surprised by that. I read the tweets, I hear the news, I see the barbs that our political leaders throw back and forth. It's been a long time since America has been so polarized, so unsure of what unites us, so torn about what we stand for. And that makes it all the more important that you are out there, arms and hearts open, feet planted on the bedrock of belonging. You're making sure that everyone sees themselves as part of the beautiful and vital tapestry that makes up our diverse communities. I see this commitment in Springfield, Missouri, where the Community Foundations of the Ozarks is supporting scouting for kids from low-income families, a rock and roll summer camp for LGBTQ youth, and uh, lots of community awareness around autism. Bridget Dirks and her team there organize around this simple question. Does everyone in our community feel as though they belong? And I guess it is almost that simple. It's not easy, but it's simple enough that even if we have made plenty of progress, if folks still don't feel like they belong, there is more work to do. You know, the folks I've mentioned here and all of you dedicated to community philanthropy inspire hope when things are tough. You motivate us to continue to work together for the future where everyone belongs. You know, building resilience, trust, and belonging requires deep listening and it requires strong relationships. It means that we need to value the unique experiences and identities that every person brings to the incredible, beautiful, complex places we call home. And to do that means that we have to recognize past harm. We have to truly grapple with the ways that throughout our collective history, some voices have heard, have been heard, and some voices have been silenced, their dignity denied by unjust systems. It's the simple truth that if we're going to build an America that we want, we have to face that truth. At the same time, we cannot succeed if we retreat into our ideological silos and treat those who disagree with us as if they're the enemy. Now that said, those engaged in dehumanization or hate, those who evoke or encourage violence, defy the very purpose of philanthropy and there is no place for them in our nonprofit sector. We've got to once again lift up the power of place. You know, one of our beloved elders and one of my predecessors uh, reminded, of this, uh, reminded us of this the last time he addressed the council audience. Ambassador Jim Joseph, who passed away this year after decades of visionary leadership in both philanthropy and public service, when he addressed the council back in 2011, he told us our differences can make us stronger, but only if we value each other as the whole complex humans that we are. He said that it holds if I diminish your humanity, my own humanity is diminished in the process. If I deny or destroy your dignity, my own dignity is denied or destroyed. So let's show what's possible when we engage constructively across differences. Let's transform conflict so that we can learn together and find new areas of common cause. Let's center our shared humanity and work toward communities and a country that works for everyone. You know, it won't be easy, but nothing worth fighting for is. And you know what I mean if you have been following the field conversation sparked by a certain op-ed that I recently signed on to. <laughs> it's a great illustration that there are many ways to view something. And understanding those differences can help make the work stronger, make us stronger. You know, I'm thinking back to those fifth graders up on stage facing some hard truths about our nation's history. And I'm struck by the way that they represent the rich diversity of this country. And I marvel at their identities and experiences and ideas and voices that they are going to add to the nation's rich tapestry. 
And I have to say I'm with Mary McLeod Bethune on this one. Our country is far from perfect, but just like the generations who came before us, we must keep reaching toward the nation we want, need, and deserve. I, for one, cannot be any more grateful to all of you who are paving the path and setting the example for my daughter, her classmates, and all of us each and every day. Thank you. Well, now we are in for the main act, the real treat, which is our Colorado uh, partners and funders who are going to talk about how they're building res resilience here in their state, moderated by Lindy um, Eichenbaum Lent from the Rose Community Foundation. And so let me invite all of the speakers up. And Lindy, thank you for shepherding this conversation. Good morning, everybody. Um, a little housekeeping note. Um, our governor is expected to address us, so when he arrives, we will pause the panel for him to speak, and then we'll restart. So please bear with us. <laughs> is he here already? Is that why y'all are laughing? OK. <laughs> I can't see a thing, so there you go. Um, so we're, we are um, excited to talk to you about crisis and resilience as we've experienced it in Colorado. But before we delve into that, we know that context matters. And so we're going to do a quick round of introductions of ourselves and our foundations so you understand the context um, in which each of us is operating when we discuss some of the work we've done. So, um, I will start, Lindy Eichenbaum Lent, Rose Community Foundation. We are a hospital conversion turned endowed community foundation that is 28 years old. We work to advance inclusive, engaged, and equitable greater Denver communities through values-driven philanthropy, really envisioning a, re a region that is strengthened by its diversity and its generosity. Um, we do our discretionary grant making across many issue areas, um, and we also lean in heavily on the policy and advocacy front across many issue areas, um, but we don't shy away from the tough ones, whether that's immigration, reproductive justice, gun violence pre uh, prevention, um, and like I assume most community foundations here, we also work to nurture a culture of philanthropy in our communities through donor services and engagement. So with that, I'm going to pass it down the road to um, my Colorado peer funders, starting with Kyle. Great, thank you, Lindy. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Hibble, and I have the honor to serve as president and CEO for El Pamar Foundation. We're located in Colorado Springs, and we were founded in 1937 by a couple named Spencer and Julie Penrose. And in 1937, when they founded us with $21 million at the time, they charged us with this amazing mission to enhance, encourage, and promote the current and future well-being of the people of Colorado. And now we, the, the staff and I, are so pleased to be able to carry forward this mission and to honor their legacy. Obviously, we do that through our traditional grant making, and we're a general grant maker, and grant applications come in. But about 35 years ago, the trustees said that we need to do more when the dollars are not quite enough. So we have a number of operating programs and direct charitable activities, whether it's our nonprofit conference facility, which is the former home of our founders, or our fellowship program, which is over 30 years old that has brought young leaders into the world of philanthropy and beyond, or our regional partnerships program, which started about 20 years ago. And that program uh, has us uh, around the state of Colorado with some 75 community leaders. And these leaders um, who know their communities make our grant making better, and we're grateful for their um, help to the foundation. And with that, I will pass it to Tatiana. 
Thanks, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. Tatiana Hernandez. I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Community Foundation Boulder County. Um, we're a 32-year-old community foundation who are responsible for, responsible for about 100 million in assets. Um, we grant make about 10 million a year. And in addition to our grant making, we operate a leadership program in partnership with our local chamber. We have a social indicators project. Um, and as you'll see from the conversation today, we've been pretty involved in disaster response over the last three years. Um, a little context on Boulder County. We're not just the city of Boulder. Um, we are a county of about 300,000 people, uh, and that includes mountain communities, cities along the Front Range, and communities on the plains. And so we're, we're quite diverse from a geographic perspective, and I like to say we're a bit of a microcosm of America. And with that, I'll pass it over to Santosh. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Santosh Ramdas. I am the president and CEO at Gary Community Ventures. Uh, we're an obsessively place-based social change and philanthropic <laughs> organization. We are obsessively place-based. Yes. Um, that was founded by Sam and Nancy Gary. Uh, and they had a long tradition of doing this. Uh, we operated under the name of the Piton Foundation for many years. And we were seen as an innovative social change actor. Sam almost believed that we should be an R&D engine. Uh, one that takes more risks and kind of builds obsessive place-based solutions that serves our community here in Denver and Colorado. In 2012, when Sam sold his company, he created Gary Community Ventures. Uh, he put an endowment into us, uh, and he gave us two mandates. One is he said he wanted us to go away in 2035, which means that we have a sense of urgency, we have a sense of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, and we're not perpetual, so we mean that we, we use that as a way to really move the needle on, on big issues and take, take significant risks on serv in service of community. Uh, the second is we, uh, we were set up a bit of like what I call a Swiss Army knife. Um, so we, he realized that real change happens in the intersection of business policy and philanthropy, and that often most power is held by folks in business and markets and also in the hands of those that make policy and, 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 and then in the hands of government. And for us to engage with those sectors, we need the tools that we need. So we're set up in a way where we have a private philanthropic foundation that opens, operates independently. We also have an investment firm that engages with market-based actors and does mission-based investments. And we also have an advocacy arm that can do campaigns and directly do political funding. And what that gives us is really fight on behalf of community, fight on behalf of place in places where these communities don't have power. Uh, and using that as a tool by which we can really move the needle. And I'm excited to share more about it today with you all. Thank you, Santosh. Okay, now that you know who we are, we're gonna get into the, the meat of this conversation. Um, to quote Santosh, as obsessively place-based funders, um, all of us are often confronting the local impacts of international events, of Supreme Court decisions, of federal policies or the lack thereof, and of national trends. Crises come in many forms, natural disasters, human-made tragedies, legal and market-driven challenges, just to name a few. And I know that my peers and I feel sometimes that Colorado has experienced more than its fair share for a state of our small size. So before we delve into the resiliency aspects, um, we're gonna talk about some of the crises that our communities have faced here in Colorado and the role that our organizations and philanthropy in general has played in responding to these crises. Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to get started on this, and it's accurate that um, crises can be long-term, whether it's mental health, but there's also more immediate crises. Um, and our trustees at El Pamar Foundation um, have determined that we need to be responsive and relevant to needs in our communities. And so this morning I'll share a couple of examples of that. So if we go back to uh, 2002, we had the, the Hayman fire, which in, at that time was the largest fire in the state's history. Sadly, it's now only the ninth largest outdone number of times over. But at that time, the trustees um, 
thought, how can we be helpful to communities, particularly those volunteer fire departments that don't have the resources they need? So whether it's um, PPE, the protective gear they wear, or the fact that local uh, firefighters and uh, federal firefighters couldn't talk because they were on uh, different radio channels. So uh, the trustees activated the Wildland Fire Fund, um, which has now put more than $6 million uh, out to support volunteer fire departments uh, and various other efforts like this. Um, so then other crises, if you look at um, a couple of years ago in Colorado Springs, we had a whopping uh, hailstorm. And, and the trustees thought, um, how can we be responsive to our community? And so we had to turn to partners to do this because we're not the ones doing the good work, but it's others who do the work and we help them along with some dollars. And so we partnered with the county to actually um, pay the deductibles of people whose uh, cars and houses uh, were destroyed through, through this effort, uh, through the hailstorm. Um, so that's an example of us partnering with local government to get things done. During COVID, the trustees uh, enacted what we called the Colorado Assistance Fund. We did three different tranches over two years of a million dollars each. The first tranche went to immediate uh, needs, healthcare, utilities, that sort of thing. The final tranche was in 2021, and we were helping underwrite um, organizations that were bringing uh, communities together, whether it were the um, Hot Rod Show or the Potato Festival. Um, and just trying to be involved in that area where um, maybe government hasn't come yet, maybe no one else is funding it, but filling, uh, filling gaps and providing um, speed to need. Speed to need, speed I love to that. Need. I love that. Everybody okay. get on board. Let me see if I can get the clicker right. Um, so Kyle and I have some similar examples, I think. Um, for those of you who maybe haven't been following Boulder County News very closely over the last few years, um, our foundation over its 32-year history has held uh, seven emergency response funds. Four of those were in the span of two years. So in 2020, we, of course, I think, raise your hand if you didn't have a COVID fund. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the fall of 2020, we experienced what at the time was the largest, still is, acreage fire in our uh, county's history, um, which mainly affected kind of rural parts and, and uh, federal land, state land fires. Um, in 2021, um, 10 people were murdered at a beloved local King Supers supermarket. Oh, they changed the slides. Maybe you should talk. <laughs> Why don't you skip forward and then we'll I'll skip forward. That's, um, that's our local King Supers. And then um, in the, at the end of 2021, uh, we experienced just the most devastating fire in Colorado state history. The Marshall Fire burned really over the course of an afternoon. Um, at the end of the day, 1,100 homes were lost, 32,000 people were evacuated, two lives were lost, um, numerous pets. And we very quickly, again, because of these experiences that we've had in our community, and because we're a small community, you know, I've got the head of emergency management on speed dial, and he's got my number, and we're in constant communication. Um, so by the end of the day, we had a fund um, up and running and was in partnership with Boulder County on that effort. Skipping through. Um, and over the course of the first weekend, we raised over $10 million and have ultimately, to date, raised over $43 million from over 82,000 donations uh, to support our community in truly a rebuild effort, a, a barn raising for Boulder County. An event of this scale not only affects the individuals that are directly affected, but losing 1,100, 1,200 homes um, in the span of an afternoon changes the housing market. So we made a commitment um, to try to help as, as much as we could to bring people home as quickly as possible. And we'll pause there. We're gonna, we're gonna pause here. I promise we'll get to Santosh. Um, but we want to invite you to experience our incredible governor, who is a tremendous friend of philanthropy here in Colorado, Governor Jared Polis. Uh, thank you so much, and we're so excited to welcome you all to the great state of Colorado. 
home of the championship nuggets. <laughs> yeah, that was just a, uh, a typical uh, Monday night last night in Denver. Um, this summit is a great opportunity to help you further engage with your peers in philanthropy around the issues that you care about the most. I want to thank Kathleen, Lindy, the team at the Council on Foundations for bringing everyone together. I got to say hi to uh, Rick Waters on the way out. Appreciate the, the um, acknowledgement. Uh, Javier Soto, although I understand he was rooting for uh, Miami Heat last night. <laughs> uh, of course, Karen McNeil Miller and Joanne Kelly, so many others. Uh, you know, philanthropy is really a foundational element of our work here in Colorado. And I saw uh, Tatiana was talking about the Marshall fires. Uh, whatever happens, uh, we know that we can count on our philanthropic partners. Uh, one example, obviously, is during the pandemic uh, when uh, philanthropy, played, philanthropy played a key role in our response. We launched a Help Colorado Now COVID relief fund. There are thousands of small businesses in Colorado that are thriving today, uh, thanks to the flexible uh, philanthropic relief funds that were available. Uh, we partnered with Mile High United Way uh, for the COVID relief fund, uh, focused on recruiting volunteers to donate their time, raising funds for prevention and impact and recovery, uh, supply drives, everything from medical supplies in the early days to food services and uh, foods for kids and small business support, behavioral health and more, uh, so critical. So too with the, uh, the Marshall fires in 2021, which Tatiana was talking about. We even did a virtual benefit concert featuring uh, great musical talent, Nathaniel Rateliff of the Night Sweats, Dave Matthews Band, Amos Lee, Avid Brothers, String Cheese Incident, Old Crow Medicine Show, many others and those funds are administered through Community Foundation as well. Uh, whatever happens, we know we can count on our philanthropic partners uh, to uh, rise to the occasion. And we, uh, on the public side, really uh, appreciate the ability to partnership because in, in large part, the flexibility of the ability to, to deploy funds. Uh, things are often more cumbersome and more difficult on the public side and we appreciate the flexibility of the philanthropic side. 135 years ago, in response to growing poverty and social challenges in Denver, Francis Weisbart Jacobs and four religious readers of different faiths established a charity organization society, which became the United Way here. Uh, grant making, advocacy, raising and distributing funds. They were instrumental in Denver building its first hospital and that's the proud tradition that we're really continuing with centering the partnerships with philanthropy. Uh, that has played such a critical role uh, during my time as governor as well as before and after. And uh, philanthropy even, even plays an important role in creating and preserving our beautiful outdoor areas here in our state. Uh, one of the two state parks that I've launched during my time as governor, Fisher's Peak, was born out of a partnership between the state of Colorado, the city of Trinidad, and philanthropic organizations, including the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Lands, and others. Uh, and that's now open to the public for visitation. It connects tens of thousands of acres of habitat on both the Colorado and New Mexico side of the border. Uh, and is a great example of really centering philanthropy in our work to uh, keep Colorado wild as well. So whether it's housing, food access, job searches, the arts, uh, there's so many important ways to invest. Uh, in Colorado, uh, we are approaching a major birthday. We're gonna be 150 years old. Uh, that's the same year our nation is 250 years old. Uh, in 2026, and that's uh, we're, we're beginning the plans already around our sesquicentennial for Colorado. It's also the semi-quincentennial for America, the 250th birthday. These are all terms you're going to need to learn to say, semi-quincentennial. Uh, and that's an important landmark. It's a chance for us to reflect who do we want to be as America at 250, who do we want to be as Colorado at 150. Uh, philanthropy will be part of that vision of who we want to be, it'll also be a big part of telling that story uh, of who we are, uh, a celebration and a reflection uh, as we reach this, these, um, these important milestones for our state and for our country. I'm excited uh, to really work on many of your sh shared goals uh, at 150, at 250 for our country, a state, a country where every person can afford to live, can work with dignity in a job that earns them a good living clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, 
the chance to enjoy the beautiful wide open spaces we all love to celebrate and participate in the arts. Uh, I want everybody to be able to live in safe communities, access health care affordably, food, clothes, and of course everybody should be able to thrive no matter who they are or where they're from or who they love. And though that may not be easy to achieve, it's a simple vision and one that I know that uh, we share your passion in working towards every day and we'll continue to work closely with the philanthropic sector. Um, so, you know, from disasters to opportunities, the philanthropic sector is a key partner uh, for the public side. And on behalf of the state of Colorado, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your work to help make your communities better uh, for the, the people and the causes that you serve. I encourage you to keep it up, and I hope that many important connections are formed here today at this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor Polis. Tatiana, is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, it's funny that uh, Governor Polis joined us at that particular moment because <laughs> I was about to um, express gratitude to state and to the governor um, for the incredible partnership that they demonstrated with us. In addition to our county HHS department being side by side with us, providing over $7 million in direct uh, initial financial assistance, um, we've partnered with the Department of Local Affairs um, in on uh, a rebuilding fund that between our two efforts totals $40 million. So uh, I love living in Colorado, and I, I like Javier. I'm originally from Miami, but if I can uh, give a, a couple of reasons why I think our community is, is particularly special is that elected officials are incredibly accessible. Um, partnerships here feel authentic and true, and, and everyone's really oriented in a way that is intended to support and uplift communities, and, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Yeah. I was really worried that I had to go right after the governor. <laughs> but, yeah, no. I Took that like, hit for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk to you all about um, from a natural disaster to what I think is a deeply man-made crisis, but an American tragedy, which is, uh, Kathleen talked about it too, which is our moment of racial uh, reckoning and, and the question of racial deep injustice that we saw in the summer of 2020 following the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, we, as an organization, uh, had to look deeply inside. Uh, we had to recognize that we sit with an immense amount of privilege as a holder of private wealth. Um, and the fact that just words of affirmation uh, is not sufficient and that solidarity and support has to go well beyond that. And one of the things we realized was that there is an American scorecard that's being kept uh, that marks the history of deep racial injustice, which is our racial wealth gap. It's like a deep scar that is persists today, and it's, if not anything, widening. Uh, so for every dollar of wealth in a black household, we see $13 of wealth in a similar white household. And for households with, same, with small kids and young children, the, that gap can be about 100 times. Uh, and there's nothing, this is purely a man-made tragedy. We, as our uh, over layers of racial oppression over the years, has led to that moment in thinking about the black versus white wealth gap. Um, and so for us, that moment in summer of 2020 meant a moment of stepping up as a foundation to say, how do we build tools that can deeply address the racial wealth gap and move the needle on that? Um, and we spent a lot of time with community. We talked to black households across income levels, listened to them deeply, and also with community leaders. Uh, and one of, the real, one of the things we realized is that there, there is an accessible path for wealth building in this country, that it is not income. Unfortunately, you cannot earn your way out of uh, earn your way into wealth anymore. I'll just be honest with you all. Um, however, home ownership is often the simplest path for wealth building. For Americans with less than $100,000 of net worth, about 80% of that comes from their primary residence. So even today, buying a home, living there is the most accessible form of wealth creation in this country. And then you look at the black home ownership rates in this country, which is about 40%, compared to white home ownership rate, which is 70%. So clearly there's a racial wealth gap, which is manifested very clearly in terms of the racial home ownership gap. And that is very true for us here. And it is a place-based question. We can drive around communities in Denver, which were historically black, and we can see that they've been gentrified, displaced, and you have luxury condominiums. And folks that have been traditionally homeowners have been, have been taken out of those places. And folks that are trying to get into home ownership can't do it anymore. So quite briefly, we launched something called the Deerfield Fund for Black Wealth. Uh, it provides up to $40,000 of down payment assistance to first-time black or African-American homebuyers in the Denver metro area. 
Uh, what it gives you is a leg up to go fight in the market, to buy a home, and you might qualify for a mortgage, but if you don't have intergenerational wealth, you don't have access to down payment. Um, and it was a deeply placed space solution for us because we named it after a place called Deerfield, Colorado, which was 100 years ago a place of beautiful, flourishing black wealth. It was one of the first agricultural homesteads in the Mountain West, uh, and it was a place of clear uh, values around black asset ownership, and that was the pathway towards wealth building that the community had clearly figured out. Unfortunately, Deerfield could not survive the Dust Bowl uh, and the Great Depression, so it went away, and we wanted to recognize that from a place perspective. Uh, we're excited to share that this has become a more systemic solution. Right now, we've deployed about five and a half million dollars. It's a $20 million fund. Uh, this is a map of homes of Deerfield home buyers, uh, Deerfield clients that are living in their homes right now due to the fund itself. Uh, and we've served about 150 families by their homes already. Uh, we've already seen about $20,000 of net worth creation in each of these households in the last year. And we think over the next five to seven years, it's gonna be 100 to $150,000 of net worth creation for every black household. So we're excited about it. Oh, Lindy. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for us, our roots as a foundation are in the Jewish community, so immigration um, is inherently tied to our core identity and core values. And um, when, in 2016, when the federal climate um, and dialogue around immigration started to change, we saw the impact on families um, in our community, in seven county metro Denver. And so we launched at the time something called the Community Action Fund, where we invested and invited donors um, to the tune of 2.3 million over three years um, to support organizations who were working with um, immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, to ensure that our neighbors in our community felt safe and welcome. Um, despite the changing tides at the federal level. Over time, um, this work in the immigrant, refugee, and migrant space has only grown as international events have created place-based crises for us, and I'm sure for many of you. Um, when the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, um, and a lot of Afghan evacuees were making their way to the U.S., our governor um, welcomed um, Afghan evacuees to Colorado with open arms, and we partnered with him to launch the Colorado Afghan Evacuee Support Fund. Um, we raised close to $1.2 million, gave grants to 15 organizations who were working with evacuees who were settling here in Colorado. Um, over time, the federal government caught up, um, and we are now a fiscal intermediary for federal dollars flowing through the state for refugee integration, um, whether those are Afghan um, refugees, Ukrainian, um, or others with Office of Refugee Resettlement status, um, to the tune of $6.1 million in federal dollars today. Um, and we think this is a really important role that all community foundations and place-based funders can play as that trusted intermediary between federal and state resources and who those community partners are on the ground. And I'm sure like many of your communities, um, in December you started seeing waves of migrants fleeing political violence and social unrest in Central and South America arriving in your communities. We certainly did here in Denver. And so um, we were fortunate to partner with our philanthropic peers, the governor, the mayor, and we stood up the Newcomers Fund, um, which is still raising money because the migrants are still arriving. Um, but to date, we've raised $700,000 to give to the nonprofits on the ground who are feeding, clothing, housing, um, and supporting these newcomers to our community. Um, in every way you can imagine. And I just remembered, I actually had pictures, but um, oh well. <laughs> so um, there you go. Here's, here's a lovely um, family from Afghanistan, and um, then we have some of um, our friends from Central and South America. Um, a theme that I've heard frequently from you all is partnership um, and collaboration in the context of um, government, um, peer funders, et cetera. 
Um, can, can each of you talk a little bit more about in these times of crisis, um, you know, what does collaboration look like in those moments? So uh, I'll go ahead and start. And, and I think that um, there's, uh, it's important to know there's value in presence. And that's a presence in being present in community, but it's also being present over a time horizon. Um, because if, if you're there um, working on an issue or being available to work on community issues, um, then you're building these trust relationships that um, wouldn't otherwise be there. And if you can't be, and it's, some, it's not very exciting uh, sometimes, but it is uh, so important that um, one is present and an organization is present with the community. Um, if you look at uh, programs that we've been involved with, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's our regional partnerships program where we are out in the community, I was in uh, Craig, um, Colorado, not too far from Steamboat, but they're closing down their um, coal plant and, and coal extraction and uh, Just Transitions, which there was a slide earlier on them, um, has also partnered with the community, but, but through our regional partnerships program, we're in that community um, trying to help them when they lose 60% of their employment base, in this instance, maybe trying to turn that into losing only 40% or 30%, but trying to find an economy that uh, will continue and last. And so being present is critically important. Thank you. If I could build on that, I think having, um, for us, it, it was really important to have those relationships before the event happens. Um, and sometimes that's not always the case or not um, intended to be the case. And I know many of you in this room have heard the, the saying, if you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. Well, if you've seen one crisis, you've seen one crisis. The dynamics are different. The systems that you're working within are different. And so sometimes it's hard to uh, predict or anticipate that you're, you'll be suddenly working with the DA's office and the Department of Justice on a mass shooting. Um, but for us, starting with the humanity of the people that are part of the systems and making sure that we recognize their secondary trauma happening, even for the folks who maybe aren't directly affected, for our team, certainly for, for anyone um, that's part of a response effort and tending to that as much as possible, or at least acknowledging that as much as possible to start to develop the trust in the moment, if that's what's necessary. But whenever and wherever possible, we're cultivating those trust-based relationships well before a moment of crisis so that in the moment, it's a text message. Um, and then the collaboration to, to the exact question will look different depending on the dynamics of the institution you're partnering with. And for us in the nonprofit sector, it was almost entirely like, do what you need to do, we'll fill you in on the back end, go, 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 because that's what nonprofits do. They just meet the moment and we'll say, we'll, we'll pay you back for whatever you do. Um, with our government partners, it was understanding, okay, what are, the, what are the limitations of CDBG and CDBGDR? What are the limitations of the state fund? How can we be the most flexible? Um, I like to say, how can we be the caulking of all of these different funds and, and resources that are available? And then help you orient your practice in a way that we think serves community best. And so um, sometimes it's us leading, sometimes it's us supporting, but fundamentally it's about understanding humanity and orienting it on um, the communities where we're all trying to serve. And Lindy, I'll also add that um, something about being place-based and which is this com community is really familiar with makes us deeply collaborative. Um, I'd spent many years in global philanthropy as well as time in both coasts before I got to Denver three years ago. When I first got here, people were incredibly nice. They were like, how can we help you? How can we work together? And you know, having spent a time in New York, which you may all know, I was like, uh, something's off here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you realize that this is, this is a love for place. It's a deep, deep love for place, which is inspiring, which is loving and caring, uh, which means that we get together and do things quickly. When we first launched the Deerfield Fund, our first two calls came from our co-funders. The Denver Foundation stepped up and said, we want to support you uh, through one of their DAF holders. And we also heard a, got a call from Colorado Trust, uh, from the Gates Family Foundation. Uh, and then once the movement came together, Robert Wood Johnson came in as an anchor funder. And they don't do place-based work, but they said, this is cool. We want to come in. Uh, and so there's a moment where I feel like place place is the future. Uh, even national foundations are taking account of it. And I think I'm excited that this 
experience of being in Denver is, is, is an, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky here. <laughs> Love it. Play space is the future. I yes. I sent a new tagline. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious what you all, what you think of the role of funders, because to your point, Tatiana, you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. So um, we all have slightly different tools in our toolbox and different perspectives, and we experience different moments of crisis. Um, so what do each of you view your role as a funder in these moments of crisis? You know, on, on the continuum of are you a crisis responder? Are you a systems changer? What, what is your role in that moment and in the aftermath as we build towards resiliency? So uh, for Elp Mar Foundation, um, we, we don't see ourselves as a necessarily a crisis responder, but we see ourselves as an organization that is charged to come alongside people in community who know better what their communities need and then support them in that, that effort. And uh, that's a real lodestar for us is to pursue that which is most important to the community. And, and we don't necessarily, uh, as long as it fits within our, our founder's donor intent, because certainly we can't, um, can't go beyond that, um, but it's, it's important to know community and in the world of grant making, um, I see uh, grant makers, uh, us as um, full service gas station attendants. So we're filling up these nonprofit vehicles and there's good ones, fast ones, slow ones. And then the drivers, is, they're actually the leadership of the organization. You've got bad drivers, good drivers, all kinds of drivers. Um, so, and then we clean their windshield and, and we say again, need new windshield wipers. So um, that's part of us just being able to support. I'm imagining you yeah. in a yeah. gas station <laughs> outfit. Right. Uh, Tatiana? Yeah, I'm in the metaphor still. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, despite what the last uh, three years, the impression the last three years might give, the Community Foundation Boulder County does not think of us as a crisis responder. We're a community responder and our community has just happened to have experienced incredible tragedy over the last three years. Um, the question was the role of philanthropy. I mean, and again, I think it depends on the circumstances and the opportunities that are at play. If, if there is an opening within a crisis to help government change its perspective on what its responsibilities are and its practices and how it orients or um, is in relationship to community, we'll take that opportunity by incentivizing it. Um, whether that's financially or by saying, this is how we're going to do it, and because we're moving faster than you, if you do it differently later, you're, the community might have a certain reaction to that. So we've found that um, in some cases it's setting the tone early with government partners or um, even with our nonprofit partners, although they're usually far afield, right? They're, they're running the gas much, much faster. Um, I think it, again, it depends, but fundamentally, and I think Santushi said this earlier, I do think the best role for philanthropy writ large is the R&D arm of government. We pilot, they scale, and sometimes we need to make sure they're scaling in a way that is still true to community values, that's still true um, a sense of service, um, not a sense of compliance, If um, and I, I say that with all due respect to our uh, public servants in the room, uh, but fundamentally it's R&D. How do, we, how do we make it all better, all of the systems better? Thank you. Um, I might be slightly controversial here. <laughs> do it, um, do it. <laughs> well, I, I, think that, I think this is a constant tension, right? We are service-minded. We want to be responding to needs as it comes up. Um, but I also think that there's an opportunity for us to shift systems fundamentally, because otherwise we're going to go after crisis after crisis after crisis. It's going to happen. Um, so I think often we're gas station attendants, but we also want to electrify the fleet at some point. And maybe we think we don't need cars. Let's use public transportation more aggressively, right? So I think there's the whole direction of how we want to go. Um, and, and so I think that's what we often spend time. I think we all do, and I think that's always the bias. The other thing I will say, Lindy, briefly, is that we have something at Gary called the Chumba Wamba Principle. Um, bear with me for a minute. <laughs> um, which is, you know, they, they did a song, and I'm not going to sing it here because that will become a crisis and you all have to run to the door. Um, I'll sing it. <laughs> but um, it, it's about you getting knocked down, you get up again, which is also not it's about. It's about the fact that they did one song and then they went away, and nobody knows anything about them. They did one amazing song, right? And 
philanthropy is really good at doing one amazing thing, and we don't know how to do it again. And one of the things we're obsessed about, if you want to do it really good, is you have to do it repeatable. You have to make it institutional. You have to make it a practice. And that's the part of, I think, long-term work that philanthropy needs to do. Thank you. It is taking a lot of self-restraint for me not to encourage the crowd to sing <laughs> Jumbo Wamba. Oh, it will be in my head all day. Um, I was inspired by the quotes that Kathleen shared in her remarks, so I had to bring one of my own. Um, you know, it was Albert Einstein who said, in the midst of every crisis lies opportunity. So I want to shift to the upside, the, the resiliency, the opportunity, perhaps the systems change. What, what comes next for your communities? What have you learned from these crises um, that makes resiliency tangible? And what, what does that look like in your communities and in your foundations? So um, Tatiana mentioned sort of that R&D phase of um, being a catalyst to uh, some form of change that's going to happen. Uh, about a year and a half ago, our, our trustees had us focus on uh, mental health, affordable housing, uh, and economic sustainability development. And in the world of, of mental health, in rural Colorado, um, you know, the number of uh, doctors who are psychiatrists are very, very few, and, and we have a focus on southern and rural Colorado. And so at our, uh, over the last year, we've been working with the University of uh, Colorado Medical Campus Psychiatry Department to help them get started with a pilot program for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring a psychiatrist at, um, at the Anschutz Medical Campus dealing with an uh, OBGYN in Lyman who had uh, a mother present and they don't know what to do. So uh, this program actually lets um, the um, center of medical knowledge in the state of Colorado communicate with uh, other professionals in the state. And so we're part of these, this pilot in making this happen um, with the hope that then the state will see value in this and, and then take it from there because um, truly that preventive work uh, will save uh, communities and individuals um, a lot of dollars and heartache. Uh, gosh, Lindy, you're asking me to talk about some things that are maybe not ready for prime time, but um, <laughs> you know, I think f fundamentally we're going to get much deeper in public-private partnership, and, and something I didn't mention, and I'm sure many others in the room were deeply engaged with their local governments, was on the distribution of ARPA funds, uh, purpose for and, and distribution of ARPA funds. And what we find, again, our government partners, whether they be city, county or state are very interested in the flexibility of our field um, and our deep relationships and trust with community that sometimes government um, struggles with to be able to deploy money faster and, and pilot things in a way that lead to the kind of systems change again if the practice doesn't become the barrier. Right, so we're deeply in conversation with all of our municipal um, partners and saying okay, ARPA distribution's one thing, there's a municipal that wants to do a universal basic income pilot. How do we partner with them to both make the practice right, but also amplify the incredible generosity of our community? So I, I mentioned earlier, we raised over $43 million. That was an unheard of amount for our community, and I, I would even say for the state in terms of um, that kind of public funding. The mean amount, the mean gift amount was $100. Think of what you can do in your community with $100 gifts. Um, for affordable housing, right? And what responsibility we have as a community foundation to elevate that as just as equal of a crisis, to Santosh's point, as, um, as something as dramatic as a fire or a mass shooting. And so that's, that's where we're leaning towards. Uh, we're in, in two places of struggle. One is clearly um, how do we create that deep sense of community trust and build institutions that can outlast, outlast us? Um, and this is hard to do, and I, I think we take a lot of inspiration from the work that El Pomar does and others do in terms of being in a community for 30 years. Uh, I mean, just staying there, like building trust and building relationships. Uh, and that kind of institutional structure that enables us to do that, or us leaving a mark by leaving an institution that can outlast us is, I think, critical, because I feel like one of the things that communities experience is philanthropies come and go. It's like a revolving door, and there's, there's no mutual sense of presence there, and there's no dimension of time, which I think, Kyle, you mentioned beautifully. 
Uh, so I think that's something we struggle with partly because we go away in 2035, so we don't want to become transactional. We don't want to become this project or that project. Um, and the second thing we are interested in, particularly from a deer fuel standpoint, is you know, we've created this pilot with philanthropic dollars, with impact investing dollars, but really to scale this at the thousands of families in Denver or millions of families across the United States, we gotta, in we gotta engage with mainstream financial actors. Uh, we gotta bring in bankers, we need to bring in mainstream capital markets, and that's a, that's a real challenge in terms of how do you build an institution that goes from our little pilot because the world is full of successful pilots, but that's the real existential question for us. So I think those are the two pieces, is staying in community for the long term and then scaling pilots into more systemic solutions. Thank you. I think for us, it's the realization that um, we cannot separate policy and advocacy from our more traditional direct service grant making. Um, and so we are spending a lot of time investing in the community infrastructure to ensure that communities that have often not had a seat at the table have voice and have access to power. Um, so philanthropy doesn't have to come in and be the savior, those days are long gone. Um, but we're really empowering communities to advocate for themselves, um, both in reaction to crises and in reaction to opportunities, um, and hopefully proactively um, to, to seize opportunities and, and avert long simmering challenges. Um, and so I spend a lot of time encouraging philanthropy to not shy away from policy and advocacy. I know it's easier for community foundations, but not all choose to use that tool in the toolbox, but there's also room at the table um, for other kinds of funders as well. And so um, I think both in times of crisis, in times of opportunity, and pretty much any time, um, philanthropy really should roll up its sleeves and, and get involved on the policy and advocacy front. That's where, that's where the long-term systems change happens for our communities. Okay, so we are nearing the end. Um, you know, Tatiana, you have said many times before, so I'm gonna quote you, because you didn't oh say it today, oh um, that when your community experiences something like a mass shooting, it is a club that no one ever wants to be a part of. And I would guess some folks here are unfortunately members of that club already, and unless things change dramatically, more of us will be joining that club in the future. So. I don't want to end on a low note, but I do want to, yes. I can give something very important. Yes. Uh, we've learned sesquicentennial liminal space, but for those of us who are, have a love of place, which we're talking about through this conference, um, you're going to need the, to know the, the term topophilia. We learned that originally from Govern, Governor Hickenlooper at the time, but topophilia is love of place, so share it with your friends at the cocktail party. <laughs> topophilia. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so with topophilia in mind, <laughs> based on, on what your communities, what your organizations have been through, what is your parting gift, your parting wisdom um, for your peers in place-based philanthropy around the country um, should they encounter challenges and crises, whether they are natural disasters or human-made um, in, their, in their futures? I, I think I would, I would say in the, to follow on in the, in the vein of uh, presence, part of that being presence, it, present is, um, uh, is listening. Um, to, uh, to individuals you're working with. Um, I think we hear a lot about seeing uh, people, seeing individuals. So you have to both listen and see to learn, and I encourage you to do that in the communities in which you live and work. Taking deep breaths. Um, the only word that, can, that comes to mind is love. And that is because even in the darkest moments, grief is love, pain is love. All of the hard things that we've gone through is because um, when we've gone through them, it is because we have such a deep love for our community and for the people in our community. So it's just as a reminder, like in those moments, to, we're in this because we love each other. Um, and I think that love is really powerful.
I was going to say first, I think we should all get t-shirts which says topophilia. Topophilia. <laughs> we should do that before Topo Chico does it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. No, I love yeah. it. I, I think that's my, I, um, I, I'm an immigrant. I'm not a US citizen yet. I'm finding my sense of place. And I come into a community with a deep sense of love, uh, which is to your point, but also uh, a sense of possibility in the places where my kids go to school and places where I live. And philanthropy is not a far away thing that we do to people that we, you know, are far away from us, but philanthropy is what's happened in our own community. And to me, that's why I think that this level of place is foundation of how we think we can sh start shifting systems. And it could start with one black homeowner, it could start with one small fund, but it can become a national movement, and that is my hope for this community. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I want to thank Kyle and Tatiana and Santosh not only for, for being part of this panel today, but for being part of the incredibly collaborative philanthropic ecosystem we have here in Colorado. We have many colleagues and peers in the audience today, and so much of what you heard talked about today might have been led by one organization, but supported by so many others. And so I just want to acknowledge the partners in this work in our peer funding community, and I'm sure you all have those same partners and um, connective tissue um, back home as well. So give yourself a round of applause. And so in closing, I just want to say for all of us topophiliacs, is that, is that <laughs> like appropriate it. usage? Um, when we think about place, right, we think about the natural beauty of where we live, we think of the built environment, but the most important ingredient I think we would all agree is the people. And one of the people who is an absolute treasure here in Colorado, we are so excited to get to share with you today, our Colorado Poet Laureate, Bobby Lefebvre. Woo! Can we back away? Thank you. Thank you very much. During times like these, days and nights when we are together, let us make an ally of the sun. Let us make an ear of the moon. Speak to her about the wolf that is the heart, the lion that is the mind, how they tussle, fangs and claws, how the lion always seems to prevail. Meet me at midnight in the shadows, where we can be what we are when there is nothing telling us we are not. The raven lattice twisting like filigree, where inhibition is abrogated and the divulging say and feel too much. Come and dance with me in this fictitious field of flowers, this tangible embrace that feels like a paradox. Let our howling be holy. Exist with me, rabid and untamable, because the world, beautiful and broken, is collapsing in on itself. I keep a map of the world hanging on my wall. Its head is bowed, its heart is heavy, there is a stench that permeates the room. I caress its topography, its gaping wounds transfer blood onto my trembling fingertips. I ask the map, what shall I do with the sanguine ink you have bestowed upon me? The map replies, take it, this unending pain, and compose with it a song so stark that the masses might for a moment make a home of all we are mourning, might for a moment sit at the table and look into each other's eyes and tell the truth. So come, all of you, and gather around the table. Bring with you the heavy luggage society has unfairly packed for you, the bags overflowing with barriers you have somehow ingeniously figured out how to navigate. Or if your bags are a bit less heavy or are filled to the brim with privilege passed down like an heirloom, bring them too. Do not fret if you feel your cup is empty or if your china is encrusted with gold, for today we'll treat this table as an equalizer. Today, honest conversation and selfless action will be the food that nourishes us. Before we sit, let us pass our stories around like bread. 
Take a piece for yourself, but always be conscientious. Ensure there is enough to go around. For some, no, there is not always enough to go around. Or maybe there's always been enough. Maybe in the back, in the rooms where the food is prepared, there is a surplus of things tucked away from the grasping eyes of the peering. Stockpiles of things, cannily sharing a wall with moaning scarcity. Maybe the meal was designed this way, where some are intentionally invited to the helping and others intentionally left off the guest list, no seats pulled out or given up, no place setting bearing their name. And as they say, if you are not invited to the table, it is possible that you are on the menu, and those without seats, those tired of being consumed, have this collection of your ugly we have been saving. Saving for moments just like these, boxes filled with old bones and new blood, attics packed with epithets and mason jars full of scars, cedar chests stacked with broken treaties and the nooses tied around our forefathers' necks. We keep under our beds, the sting of your water hoses and the no dogs, Negroes, or Mexican signs you once flew proudly like flags. Buried in lock boxes beneath our fruit trees is the barbed wire of your internment camps, the bars of the prisons you built salivating with us in mind. We have, next to the extra virgin Mary candles in our closets, the gods ripped from our grandmothers, the languages choked out of our throats, we have albums thick with snapshots of history our DNA refuses to forget. We store in file cabinets next to broken olive branches the names of family and friends deported, the names of family and friends banned, and you wonder why we grimace when we taste your apple pie, why the sweetness you savor is too bitter for us to swallow. You wonder why we kneel when your flag is raised, why our bald fists still have to punch holes in your pretty blue sky, because we know that what the machine hasn't already swallowed, it will most definitely be coming for. Tractors with growling bellies and flesh between their teeth, this disease that runs rabid through them, this unquenchable thirst for things that are not theirs, your tables are not new to us. These things you made us fashion but refused us to sit at, our hands and feet and hearts know them well. This perk of being the builder, this perk of baptizing the wood with your sweat. In your rearview mirror, you can see us coming for you. But we're not coming for your head necessarily. We're aiming for the humanity that lives somewhere in the basement of your heart. Our very existence is ceremony. This struggle sewn into our being. This survival radiating from our resilience. This joy we make space for despite the sting. Do not be surprised if we ask why the invitation was late. If we show you we built a table of our own, one we fashioned out of necessity when we realized yours wasn't large enough to hold us, don't be surprised if we hand you a wrecking ball before we do our voice, if we ask you to dismantle the comfortable place you sit at as we watch, and then when you are finished, pass the wrecking ball to us, we too will break down the silos we have built. Then, when we are both standing in the rubble of what used to be, let us weigh our pieces until the scale is balanced. It is not enough to have a seat at the table. We want to design it. So let us destroy to rebuild anew. Let us unpack our bags, lend each other our ears, and gift each other our hearts for listening and loving our foundations to understanding and conflict does not have to be combat. Conflict can be a supple garden that change grows in. So let's grow things together. Let us sit at a new table, pass our stories around like bread, eat, be fed, be healthy, be valued, and truly be heard. Thank you. Thank you. What an amazing start to this conference. Thank you. I know what we heard on this stage likely resonated with many of you and the work that you do, and we are so excited after a year of planning to be here together to bring back this conference uh, for all of you. So thank you for joining us in Colorado. Um, I'm Natalie Ross. I'm a vice president at the Council on Foundations and have just a bit of housekeeping before we continue on with our day. Um, we wanted to make sure as you get ready to enter the rest of the conference 
that you're aware of the expansiveness in the agenda. That was on purpose. We know for many of you, you are excited to reconnect. So we wanna make sure you have space to meet each other, to connect with the teams that you came with, um, and to build new relationships here in Denver. So a couple of things to highlight over the next few days as you plan your agenda. One, um, on both days of the conference, immediately after the morning plenary, there's a 45 minute networking break. Um, that's for you to connect with others um, and to plan your day together. Today, there's also a networking lunch where you can meet with affinity groups or find new friends here in the main room and gather together. You can check those options on the conference app, which 75% of you have downloaded. So great work. See if we can get that higher. Um, great, so then for arts and wellness, there's lots of opportunities for you to take care of yourself here in Denver. For those of us not from Colorado, the altitude is real. Please drink a lot of water and take care of yourself. There will be more morning early riser opportunities tomorrow for yoga, meditation, or to go for a run or a walk. And there's a recharge lounge if you need it um, here in the main space. We do have two pop-up conversations today that you wanna make sure to consider in the app. One is intentional LGBTQ funding, which is about local organizing by queer and trans folks to combat anti-LGBTQ policies. And a second is about the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action and how it may impact philanthropy and foundations. So you may want to consider switching those on your agenda. And then finally, this evening, we're excited to have fun together in our grand reception, uh, sponsored by the Walton Family Foundation. So we'll have entertainment, music, food, drinks, and we hope you join us at 6.30. Tomorrow, we'll be back here for our plenary in the morning. We do have a special surprise, so try to be here right at 8.30. And overall, we hope that you connect with us on social. There is a conference hashtag. Um, and as the Vice President for Membership as one of my jobs, thank you to all of the members of the council who are here. If you're not yet a member, we hope you'll consider joining and there'll be a membership booth in the lobby. So if you have any questions today or throughout the conference, you can stop at the registration desk, find a council staff uh, with the yellow ribbon, and thank you all for being here. Have a great conference.